Hello everyone, welcome back for another uh, video lecture for business ethics. Um, we're still in our crash course on ethical theory and my my main uh, ambition for tonight is to get through Mill and maybe start Kant. Um, my other in-class version of business ethics had their class this afternoon and I had the same ambition and, and we didn't quite get there. Um, but we also had a lot of class discussion too. So um, maybe I'll be more efficient on this video. But those of you in the chat, don't be shy about asking questions and jumping in. Um, definitely the more questions you ask, uh, the more content I can provide and it always makes this a richer experience. So uh, let me know how things are going. I know that uh, during these um, crash course lectures we're going to be um, sort of giving a lot of material in a packed into a small space. So there's a lot to chew on and a lot to process. Um, you're wondering if I could share some of the interesting discussions I had in the other class. Um, I'd have to try to get back in the, the mindset for that. I'm not sure my memory will do it all. There, there is, I, I, when I'm teaching the, the on-campus classes, I always like to do them in this really mixed seminar format where we're just kind of discussing and lecturing back and forth. So uh, there was a lot that happened. Um, yeah. I'll, I might have to try. Maybe during the break, I'll, I'll try to think up some if there are any like cool highlights to share. Um, but definitely, all of it that happened with my students this afternoon on campus was a combination of people asking clarifying questions, so making sure that they're understanding what's going on in the theory right, um, and sometimes that gets us off into some other things, and then also evaluating it. So thinking about whether you agree or disagree with these ideas is um, another thing that like stimulates that stuff. <laughs> Please. Okay, I'll I'll see if I can I can't try to recover some of it. Um, it's a little hard. Uh, when I prepare for class, I'm like it's I sometimes joke it's like putting all this stuff in a bag, and then when I take it out, then it's like all gone. And then when I gotta give another lecture later on, I'm like trying to get it all back in the bag again. So my mind is already trying to reset <laughs> in order to give you all a, a good experience with this lecture and, and so it can be kind of fresh. Um, so I've kind of like already like pushed all this afternoon's class out of my brain to make room for, for this one. But anyway, um, I also wanted to mention, um, oh, what was it? I, dang it, I just lost track of my own train of thinking. Um, oh, I was going to talk about the lecture notes. Um, so tonight's lecture, in, at least with fi finishing up Mill, we're going to be working a little bit more with lecture one. I, I still have some more things to talk about with quality and how Mill's going to be proposing um, we uh, figure out the relative qualities of different pleasures and pains. That's a main priority. Um, and then we'll also be getting into Mill lecture two and the sort of story of how Mill is going to try to argue for and justify um, utilitarianism as the supreme moral theory, universal and objective and unconditional. Which, as I've mentioned before, um, making an ethical theory is a very ambitious thing. You're making very audacious, audacious claims, but all these philosophers recognize the burden of proof that they're under, and seeing how Mill's going to try to shoulder that burden of proof is, is another one of the main objectives for tonight. So it'll be in Mill Lecture 1 and Mill Lecture 2. Also, what I want to kind of note to everybody, um, if you're using those notes and kind of following along with the, these video lectures by looking at those, whether you're in the chat or doing that on YouTube um, later for yourself, uh, either way, know that those lecture notes are not, uh, I'm not talking about everything that's on them exhaustively because uh, those uh, lecture notes are written for my ethical theory class where we spend like a week and a half on mill. Um, and and for all these theories. So we're kind of taking it even slower and digging into it more. Um, so uh, I, this is a, I'm trying to make this a more abbreviated presentation of these theories uh, while still giving you a very robust understanding of what's happening with them and how sophisticated they are and all the resources they have at their disposal. Uh, but there is some stuff that's being skipped. So if you're following along with the lecture notes and you see a note there that's like, see some some of my notes where we we're like I don't remember that happening in the video lecture it's very likely it didn't happen um, but if it looks interesting or intriguing to you and you want to know more about it uh, feel free to contact me and we can talk about that too if you want to try to get more out of this um, I'm happy to support and enable an opportunity to happen so let me know um, and as always 
especially for those of you who are watching this on YouTube later. Um, if you've got questions about this material, find some way to get them to me and I'll try to answer them. Um, I haven't really received a whole lot of questions through um, email or anything this week about the, the previous mill lecture. Um, but if I if I had anything like that, I would definitely, um, if, we, if we didn't get the chance to talk somehow, uh, I'd try to use some of this uh, video lecture space to answer the questions that you have. So we'll see how it goes. But stay in contact with me. If there's, if there's stuff, especially if you're, actually, I also want to say this, especially if it's feeling with all this material happening so fast that it's just like, you're like, I'm not tracking what's going on. I'm, uh, it's kind of, I feel lost. Um, I don't know where to begin with understanding what's going on here. Um, definitely, please, please, please uh, contact me so we can talk that over. A lot of times talking more one-on-one -on -one, um, can really help me uh, figure out how to make make it accessible and kind of connect the dots for you for where you're at. Um, so uh, let me know. Don't be shy about asking questions about it or reaching out to me. I'd love to do that. Are you are you saying Liling? Are you saying uh, yes? You are. You're feeling that way. Feeling lost. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we we got a plan to to talk on the phone, so we can do that. Um, if you've got particular questions that you know, uh, feel free to ask them here as as I'm talking through things, and I'll try to answer those questions. Um, I know that sometimes that's a tall order, especially if you're having the experience of feeling lost. And that's for all of you out there on YouTube who are watching this. Um, sometimes even be, being able to articulate the question is a, a, a challenge. Um, that can be half the battle. And actually, if you can articulate a question, you're halfway to solving it in philosophy. I think that that pattern definitely holds true. Um, but I, I can help you with that too, with knowing what are kind of the questions to ask. I can try to hunt those down with you. Um, and I find that kind of thing it works best in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Um, but if, if there are particular questions that anyone in the chat has that they know, uh, please drop them in there, and I will definitely integrate them into the lecture tonight. Okay, so picking up where we left on on Tuesday, um, right at the end there, I, we talked about the utilitarian calculus and uh, how to apply the principle of utility. Um, and sort of painting the picture of what it looks like to be a utilitarian. And I think you got a lot of the, the basics and the foundation of that from Tuesday's lecture. Um, but there was one big thing that I was talking about right at the end and didn't have all the time to, to kind of completely flesh out. Um, and that was the utilitarian calculus variable of quality for utility. So I want to discuss that uh, and talk about that a little bit more. Um, uh, because it's it's a it's a pretty important uh, adjustment that Mill is making, and it's going to have big a big impact on um, how utilitarianism is actually going to work and its ability to respond to possible objections. Okay, so if you remember, just as a quick summary, um, if you're a utilitarian, if you believe in utilitarianism as a moral theory, then you think there's only one moral rule the principle of utility, that whenever you act, act in such a way that you maximize utility, which means that every time you're having to make a decision, make a choice about something, uh, you have to look at all the options, anticipate the consequences of each of those courses of action, see the consequences in how they affect people and their experience, um, particularly with regard to pr their people's preferences. Would making this happen and the consequences that would come from that um, mean uh, people's preferences would be met or not met? And um, you're sort of gauging the relative weights of those consequences according to all of these variables of quantity. So we had, let's see if I can do them all from memory, intensity, duration, proximity, certainty, extent, purity and fecundity. So those were uh, seven variables of quantity that we talked about in the last lecture. And then we were adding a new variable to this, and that was uh, quality. But before we leave the quantity stuff completely behind, I want to remind you that when it comes to all the things of quantity in measuring utility, um, they're all completely subjective in the sense of just, if that's how it makes you feel, then that's how it makes you feel. 
and that's a fact about the situation um, that might be different from person to person. The same circumstances could make one person really happy and make another person really sad. So it could be consistent with one person's preferences and inconsistent with another person's preferences. Um, and there's not a universal pattern to that and the utilitarian calculus doesn't mind that. It's just like if it makes you happy, great. If it makes you unhappy, okay, we'll respect that too. Um, and there's no kind of prejudging about the appropriateness of that stuff. It's just, are you feeling pleasure or pain, physical or emotional or whatever? Um, that's all it's being sensitive to. And there's not this prejudgment. When quality gets introduced, there is going to start to be some objectivity to what's going on here. And we'll talk about why and how that's true and, and what would motivate Mill to include something like that in the theory. But um, in terms of all the quantity stuff, it's supposed to be empirically observable and it's just a matter of people's feelings um, and however people feel you know that's what the utilitarian calculus is going to respect even when it means respecting um, certain feelings that maybe otherwise our moral intuitions and some other people's moral perspectives would treat as illegitimate if you remember my example of uh, sadism so if someone's taking pleasure in the suffering of others Utilitarianism in sort of figuring out what would be the right thing to do, it's, it's almost never going to say that sadism is the thing that maximizes utility. But in at least comparing it and judging it, it does count the sadist's pleasure as a consideration in favor of the sadism. And uh, for other moral theories, that would be kind of some intuitions against that. Like that shouldn't even be considered at all. So that's another interesting aspect to utilitarianism um, that uh, sometimes is a source of objection to. But if you also remember from um, stuff I was talking about on Tuesday, Mill's aware of these sort of criticisms of utilitarianism that charge that it's basically reducing human beings to pain pleasure machines and everything that's meaningful in life to just this hedonistic kind of pain pleasure calculus. So certainly the utilitarian theory is trying to take everything that we value and reduce it to like a common ethical currency kind of like an economic currency and that's utility so we can take any any of the things we value and reduce it to utility and then now we've got that common currency to be able to compare things that are utterly dissimilar to each other in trying to figure out which actions the best um, so it allows you to compare things that otherwise you might think are uncomparable be like how do you decide between those two things well utilitarianism gives you a way um, by reducing everything to pain and pleasure feelings. But when you do that reduction, um, there's kind of this objection that utilitarianism is generating counterintuitive results in as much as many of the things that we value uh, and value very deeply end up on the utilitarian calculus maybe not scoring that high. Um, and I mentioned a couple of these things like um, good examples are the value that we have on freedom um, the value that we have on human relationships and the value that we have on maybe things like the truth and we value those things in a way that's not just cashed out in terms of the pain and pleasure we feel about them um, in many cases uh, if it was just a matter of like how much feelings of pleasure it, it, it's kind of like well looks like we should all be doing heroin because that's like a lot of pleasure and we just need to find a way to avoid withdrawal symptoms and deal with all the other health issues and then we can make everyone really happy right um, and that seems not quite right um, that uh, just that pure feeling of pleasure shouldn't be able to outweigh those other values and Mill respects that and says yeah that would be a problem if the utilitarian theory is generating those kinds of counterintuitive results I mean, he's not a big fan of intuition. We'll talk about that today, too. But he's he kind of takes that objection to heart and says, okay, yeah, that's a good point, opponents of utilitarianism. But um, I don't think the theory is garbage. I think it can be fixed. And his main idea for how to make a fix is by introducing quality. So we'll talk, we'll talk about that next. Uh, you're wondering, what's economic currency? I mean, like um, any currency, like the U.S. dollar or um, pesos or uh, any any kind of currency 
what is sort of cool about money um, and why it's so uh, useful as a social institution, which it is, is that uh, it allows us to um, basically trade resources in a common way. So whether you want to buy a lawnmower or you want to get um, back surgery, you pay for everything in dollars. It's a, it's a common unit of value in the same way that for utilitarianism, no matter what kind of diverse values of what people think are good or what they care about, what they desire, what they have preferences for, utility is like the common unit of value um, that allows us to compare all those things against each other. So I can do things like, what should I do with my afternoon? Should I host a tea party for my friends or should I go skydiving? Like those two things are like totally different. But the utilitarian theory gives you a way to compare them and make a decision about what to do. Okay. Um, let me collect my thoughts for a second. Where, where am I going? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I think I might have also mentioned this in the lecture on Tuesday. But I think it's almost a matter of pride for Mill that his moral theory, utilitarian, his version of utilitarianism, uh, would be kind of confirmed if it was reflecting back to us just what we care about. Um, in, in many ways, Mill's theory of utilitarianism is not him getting on a soapbox and telling everyone what they ought to value, in his opinion. He's really trying to find a theory of ethics that's truly universal, that it's less like, Mill's like, I know what's best for everyone, but he's like, here's the way for us to think about what's best for us, right? Like, this is a theory that's just, this is what you th already think. And um, I think I foreshadowed some of his arguments that I'm going to be talking about later tonight um, in saying that he kind of thinks everyone is a utilitarian, they just might not realize it or own up to it, but they really are, and that's one of his arguments for it. This is also connected back with... Um, the relativism realism debate. I'm not sure. I, it, this definitely happened in my on campus class. They're kind of all getting mixed up in my head, but I'm not sure I talked about the third option in that debate because you've got realism believes in uh, objective universal truth because they think that truth is stance independent, doesn't depend on our subjectivity, um, so it's sort of external to us. And then you had the relativist who didn't believe in universal objective truth. The relativist believed. Um, that just like everyone has their own truth um, because they think that truth was just sort of a function of people's beliefs and values. So whatever is, whatever you value, that's the truth for you kind of thing. There's another option. Um, you could have a position called subjectivism, which thinks that moral truth, if you're a moral subjectivist, that thinks that moral truth depends on us and our subjectivity. It's stance dependent. Without agreeing with relativism uh, in denying objective universal truth. So the subjectivist believes in objective universal moral truth or objective universal moral standards, um, but thinks that they come from human subjectivity. So they're still a part of the world of our subjective judgments, but there's some universal patterns to that. I don't know if you remember, but with when we talked about relativism, relativism was saying truth is stance dependent, but in a more detailed way, we'd say the relativist is linking the truth of things to just what people believe. To And those are things that are utterly contingent, right? We all have different opinions and beliefs and values on stuff. So that's not going to be the same from person to person. Um, but if the subjectivist wants to say, hey, look, there's something about our subjectivity that isn't contingent, that is universal, maybe that could serve as a universal standard for ethics and morality. And that's exactly what Mill's going to try to do here. Um, he does believe in objectivity, and we'll see that with this his emphasis on quality, the variable in the utilitarian calculus, and the arguments he's going to offer on behalf of the whole theory. So I, I think your, your understanding of Mill is headed in the right direction if you see him as theoretically motivated to create a moral theory that just sort of re reflects back to us how we already value things and just helps us to think about that in a more careful way to try to make more consistent judgments to not do things that are irrational 
Um, but it still kind of is a, it's a moral theory that's based on us and what we care about. And so uh, Mill is always trying to make sure that the utilitarian calculus is capturing those subjective realities accurately. So if we're thinking, you remember my metaphor before of the moral landscape and a moral theory is like a map trying to depict that landscape? From Mill's perspective, the moral landscape is not out there, it's in us and in like all of humanity taken together. Uh, and not just all people who have actually existed, but also all possible ways in which humanity could exist. That's all together in one, that's, a, that's the world to explore. And the map that he's trying to create is a map of the, of the sort of patterns to that subjective space. Um, so it's an interesting way to approach this. Uh, subjectivism does sit, and some people think sits uncomfortably between a little bit of realism and a little bit of relativism. A lot of realists uh, I've talked to think that subjectivism will devolve to relativism, that you can't block that. It, once you go subjective, once you're talking about stance dependency, there's no way to avoid um, denying universal objective truth. But people like Mill disagree with that and think there is a way to do it. So we'll take a look at what he's got in mind later on tonight and see whether you agree that he has been able to accomplish that, what ha that he has been able to uh, make an argument to defend utilitarianism as a universal objective truth. Okay, but let's uh, let's get a little more into the details of quality. So, I, I mentioned, I think I mentioned on Tuesday, in Tuesday's lecture that Mill thinks that once you add quality into the calculus, that's going to really change the game. So you could have a small quantity of a, of a certain pleasure but it's a high quality and it the the fact that it's high quality even though it's really small in quantity uh, that could outweigh on the utilitarian calculus a um, large quantity of low quality pleasures and the same thing with pain that a very small um, like maybe short intensity or small intensity short duration something like this um, that a very small quantity pain could be more significant, more of a problem than a large quantity of a lower quality pain. Um, so he definitely thinks of this as, as having a pretty big impact. So sometimes I like to explain um, what Mill has in mind at, of thinking about uh, quality of a p pain or pleasure as like a coefficient that you multiply the quantity by. And uh, if you know about coefficients in math, you know that they can drastically alter an amount um, based on the numbers involved. So if you've got a, a coefficient of 2 versus a coefficient of 0.14, uh, I mean the initial values that you're multiplying those coefficients by are going to be drastically altered. And that's that's how big of a deal Mill thinks um, quality could be and and is. But here's the interesting thing. With all the quantity stuff, it's like whatever's happening for you, that's cool. You know, the theory's going to respect that. Um, and it's completely derivative of your subjectivity. Uh, if, it makes it ha if it makes you happy, cool, right? We're not judging it. But when it comes to quality, Mill is really intending that the quality rankings um, for different pains and pleasures is something objective and universal. It's not different from person to person it's kind of the all things considered big picture sort of view this stuff is better in life and this stuff is worse in life um, these are the bigger impacting pleasures and pains and that you might have a question of like how do you figure this out um, I sometimes describe uh, quality as a mysterious theoretical property X which Mill wants to use to kind of solve these uh, counterexample problems or the hedonism objection that utilitarians face. But once, if we're going to say, okay, there's this objective property in there, the big question is, what is it and how do we figure it out? Um, and it's a little hard to, to determine this. I, I think this is one of the more challenging things of understanding Mill's theory. So um, hopefully my explanations will work. Chat, you let me know um, how this is going. But uh, I think we start, we should start with this. Again, Mill really wants to make sure that just 
how we value things squares with how utilitarianism is talking about value with utility. So uh, here's a little example that I think is actually helpful. When you were younger, you might have valued things at a pretty high priority, um, but now that you're older, with maybe some more experiences, you're like, yeah, that was silly. Like, I thought this was the the end-all and be-all of life. And now I'm like, mm, that's not that meaningful, not that important. Um, and uh, so that's one thing, like, that we think that we sort of learn and grow in our understanding of what's good, especially as we get more life experience. So that's, treat, just put that idea off to one side. Another idea, something that happens, an observation about how we value things that Mill wants the theory to reflect. Um, sometimes there are, well, like we already talked about, there are things that we value that uh, don't that, that we give them significance in how we value them in a way that's not commensurate with just how they make us feel, like uh, relationships with family and friends, like truth, like freedom, stuff like that. Even justice. We'll talk about justice later. So that's another thing he wants to respect. Um, another thing he wants to respect. is that um, if we have differences in what we value or what we desire, what we have preferences for, uh, it seems like the best way to explain those differences is through the contingencies of our life experiences. Um, that we've all experienced different things, we come from different cultures, we were raised by different parents, um, we were influenced by different moments in our lives, and that's why we have the values that we do. And Mill wants to kind of take that as well. So that's another little idea. And he's going to put these all together in a certain way. And actually, um, I forgot to grab Paint, Microsoft Paint. Here, uh, just give me a second, and I'm going to do that. So I'm going to use uh, use a little whiteboard here. And on the chat, uh, let me share the screen so those of you in the chat can see what I'm drawing. Um, here we go. Okay. So there's my whiteboard. Um, okay, so I'm this is, this is a very simple sort of diagram, but take the take this little box. This box is a map of all human experience, all and not just the ones that people have actually had, but all the ones that they could possibly have. So nothing's been left out here. And for any of us, we we you know have some experiences. But there's a lot of stuff that we have not experienced um, that's sort of outside of the boundaries of, of direct experiences that we had and even things that we can imagine. And other people have explored different parts of these possible human lives. Um, but we might have some overlap with other people. So they've experienced some things that we have not. Um, it's outside of our boundary, but there's some things we both experienced like you can talk to your friend and be like, hey, did you see that movie? Yeah, I saw it too. Let's talk about it kind of thing. Um, so might have some shared experiences, but then also ones that are different. And there's a lot of options here, and there's a lot of people. I don't know if there's anyone you have no overlap with. There maybe are some more basic things about being a human being that we share in common, but this is supposed to represent an entire map. And Mill sort of thinks that if you wanted to have like all the different pains and pleasures here ranked on a objective and universal priority list of which things have higher quality and which ones have lower quality that that list would be would need to be perfectly informed by the entire map so the entire map of all human experiences if it's experience that informs what we value if we wanted to have some objective ranking of all these things, of what stuff's more important, what's less important, we'd have to have access to all the possible experiences. And Mill doesn't think that we can do that, but what it, it does do is it sets up this kind of, this is like a little flash I'm drawing, um, it sets up this possibility of an ideal, like an objective truth, which we could get closer to or further away from. And in many ways, this if it is something we learn from experience, this is almost exactly how we understand uh, scientific progress. Science is trying to understand the world objectively and universally, 
but it doesn't see everything. Um, scientists are always um, through aided through technology finding ways to observe more and more parts of the universe. So our sphere of what we're able to experience and, and come, come into contact with is getting larger and larger. Uh, and that means we end up recognizing things that we didn't recognize before. We're getting wiser and wiser about this. So we might be getting closer to the truth, uh, the absolute truth, but we never get completely there. But the theory allows us to sort of talk about progress, of getting closer or further away. And I think this is how Mill thinks about quality. Quality really is an objective property, but our understanding of it and our knowledge of its objectivity is something that's always kind of a moving target as we uh, are able to consider more of these possible human experiences. So um, we're not stuck to our own devices here. I mean, we can... Um, we can learn from each other. We can um, talk to each other and uh, try to get more of a sense of this. I mean, Mill in the reading, I don't know if, how many of you have read it, but or taken a look at those selections, but Mill definitely thinks that we should be also looking to history. Like, the circumstances of humans in past history are different than uh, some of the circumstances we have to face today. And they're another part of the map. They reveal another part of what it means to be human and what life can be about, um, what are the possibilities, and uh, what we might find valuable. So he thinks studying history, studying other cultures, uh, just talking to people who have different experiences than you, this is all important if we're trying to understand quality. And um, I think I'm going to kind of abbreviate this part of the lecture, but if you're following along in the lecture notes, Take a look at uh, Mill Lecture 1 here, and on the second page, um, the part where I was talking about quantity, uh, and then I say Mill attempts to make room for quality. And then he's got a couple tests for how to figure out what are the higher and lower quality pleasures and pains. And he talks, about, I've got two listed here, the gratification test and the privileged perspective test. I, I think the gratification test is not very great. Um, but the privilege perspective test is a little bit better. They both have a kind of common pattern to them, um, and very much keeping with Mill's subjectivity. Um, with both of these tests, you're going to be looking to the judgment of someone. You're going to look, be looking at someone's preferences, uh, the preferences of an ideal judge. So it's kind of, um, both of them are kind of like arguments from authority. If I want to uh, figure out... Um, who, uh, what's wrong with my car? I want to take it to a, a car mechanic who I think is going to be a good authority about that. I don't trust myself because I know jack shit about cars. I mean, I don't have any experience with them. I don't have any experience with repairing them. I actually don't even own a car. I don't have a driver's license. So if it was my partner's car, I mean, I'm the last person you should be talking to. My judgment doesn't matter for squat. But the car mechanic's judgment might be trustworthy. I could learn something I don't understand directly by uh, taking an argument from an authority and say, well, whatever they judge, that's what I'm going to believe. Now, this isn't being a sheep. This isn't not being a critical reasoner or something. Argument from analogy, or I'm sorry, <laughs> argument from authority is one of the basic forms of inductive reasoning. There's nothing irrational about it. And you do need to do some critical thinking about it, because in order to make a good argument from authority, you have to show the credentials of the source and why we should be considering that judgment as evidence for the truth of something. So with the car mechanic, I might ask, like, what's your experience? Uh, what's your track record? Um, that might be important, too. So the, there's a lot of things we could ask about it. And Mill's not doing anything different here. He, if we're going to look to a certain person's judgment as a guide for what objectively has higher or lower quality, um, again, the person's judgment is not determining it. The person's judgment is just evidence or an indicator of this universal reality. Um, so it's not like giving power to people's opinions or something like that. That's not what's going on here. Um, but there's going to be some qualifications here for being an ideal judge of quality. And um, different, depending on what we're trying to evaluate, some people might be more or less uh, the right person for the job. Um, the, like I said, I don't, I don't think the gratification test is a very good one. 
um, I think it's open to a lot of objections. So I'm, I'm going to kind of focus a little bit more on the privileged perspective test. I think this one is mills on some better footing and it more closely aligns with all the rest of what he's up to theoretically. And, okay, I'll, I'll just give you a little bit. Gratification test is like this. If you want to know what's a higher quality pleasure, look to some, the preferences of someone who's not easily satisfied by life. And whatever does satisfy them, that must be the good shit. So um, let me use an example. Uh, when I was in grad school in Michigan, I used to travel down to Chicago to visit an old college friend. Uh, her name was Anne Marie, uh, who worked at a wine bar. So she'd take me out on these like wine tasting things that they'd have at the wine bar. And uh, she was picky. She was picky about her wine. I'm not so picky. If it's red wine and it's going in my face, I'm happy. If it's white wine, I'm like gross. But red wine, it's like pretty much all the same to me. So if I was drinking red wine, I was happy. She was, she'd go around the room, she'd be like, meh, that one's not so great. Nah, that one's okay. Um, then she'd be like, this one's good. This one's a good one. This is the one that's satisfying me. And to maybe, like, if my friend Davey had been there, uh, kind of an external observer to this, like, Anne Marie and I are both going around the room trying out wines, and I'm like, this one's great. Oh, this one's great too. This one's great as well. Anne Marie's like, nope, 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 yes. Then Davey might, it might be rational for him to say, Anne Marie is the better judge here. She's going to be the better indicator of the higher quality wine because she's harder to please. Okay? Now, this, like I said, I think this is open to a lot of objections, but that's the basic idea of the gratification test. There's going to be a qualification for whose opinion should you be looking at for guidance. Uh, and that's going to happen with privilege perspective test too. But it, I think the qualifications here are uh, maybe maybe a little more trustworthy, a little better indicator uh, of what's going on here. And again, I, I might sound like I'm beating a dead horse here, but this is not a matter of someone say so, making it so. Not at all. Um, just the same way that my mechanic making a judgment about my car does not make the truth about my car. It's just a good indicator of the truth. Okay, um, That's definitely what Mill has in mind here. And um, by the way, with both of these tests, if you're trying to figure out quality, you might consider yourself as the authority if you meet the qualifications for being the ideal judge. Or it could be somebody else. Especially on those things that you're like, because you can have a recognition of this. I mean, human beings have a tendency to treat themselves as the authority on everything, especially in morality. But people can have modesty. I mean, there's definitely some matters that I'm like, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm in a good position to make a judgment call about this ethical question or issue. Um, maybe this person could, this person would be in a better position to um, sort that out. Someone who's thought about it more or has more experience or direct experience um, might be able to make a better judgment call about that than I could. Um, so you could have an, an awareness of how you're not in the position to be able to make the best judgment about this thing and maybe look for someone who does. Um, so be in those moments where you recognize that you are actually not the qualified authority that you'd go seeking one. Um, but either way, whether it's you or somebody else doesn't ultimately matter. As long as the qualifications are met, that's what we're looking for. In the privileged perspective, and actually let me say something more about the title of this privileged perspective test. Um, we're not talking about privilege the way that sociologists talk about privilege. Like if we uh, talk about people who are privileged in society or by society, um, like white male privilege or this sort of thing. Um, that's a matter of people's uh, sort of power position in society um, that kind of confers some advantage because of how society is structured that isn't you know otherwise earned or something. And uh, that's not a very technical definition. I'm sorry, it's getting a little late. Um, but uh, when Mill's talking about a privileged position, he's not talking about people in society who have privilege are the better judges. That's not what he's saying. This is just the, the notion of a privileged perspective could be as simple as like um, if you're watching a sporting event, someone who's sitting in the front row is in a privileged position with regard to someone in the back row just in terms of seeing what happens. Um, whenever I go to a sports game, like I go see Blazers basketball games or, or go see the Mariners or something, uh, I'm poor, so I'm underprivileged in that sense. 
uh, <laughs> so I, I, maybe that wasn't a good example because it's confused. But um, you know, from the back row, sometimes it's hard to see what's going on, especially on like a close play. But someone who's closer can have a better idea of what actually happened because they're being closer, they're able to see it more clearly. Um, or maybe imagine like if someone, if it's a sports game and something happens that's uh, really close, like a bang bang play, something something that's really did they step on the line or not or something? Um, you know, people people that are able to watch it in slow motion are in a privileged position to make a judgment about what happened versus people who don't have access to the slow motion video. So if you're watching it live, you might be like, that looks good to me. But on slow motion, it's like, oh, yeah, it's not even close. Right? So um, that's all we mean by privileged perspective is being in the right position to be able to see something more clearly. And like in the example of a car mechanic, it's their experience and maybe their training or schooling or education that puts them in that position to have a better idea of what's actually going on with my car, to make a judgment about that truth. And that's the same thing that Mill has in mind here. With the privilege perspective test, he's got two major qualifications in mind. Um, well, actually, let me tell you about how the test would work first, because it's a little different than the gratification test. Um, so in the privilege perspective test, we're going to be looking for an ideal judge. And then once we've found them, I'll talk more about those details in a second. But once we've found them, um, we ask them, uh, take these two different pleasures or pains, if we want to do pains. Take these two pleasures that have equal quantity to them. So we're holding that variable stable. And then we ask them, if you had to choose one, which one would it be? And whichever one the, uh, the privileged perspective judge person uh, prefers, that uh, determines the higher quality pleasure. Whichever one the judge, uh, if we're talking about two pains, whichever one the judge avoids or would choose against, that's the higher quality pain. Okay, so it's, again, this is maybe um, more evidence for why modern utilitarians oftentimes want to talk about utility in terms of preference satisfaction. How Mill talks about figuring out quality really starts to make it seem like we're talking about preferences here. That's, that's really the main reality. Rather than pain and pleasure feelings, uh, this is really about uh, desires and, and what we would prefer. Okay, so how do you figure out who's the right judge, whose uh, preferences are going to be this kind of indicator or evidence of quality? Well, they need to meet two conditions. One is experience. So if they're trying to judge between two pleasures and one of them they've never experienced, they can't judge it. It's like I can't make judgments about the value of things I've not encountered or experienced. I, I can't tell you how good of a wine it is if I've never tried it kind of thing. So it, that... It, that could be a problem, like if um, if you're asking me advice about wines, uh, which one is better, and I haven't tasted one of them, then I probably am not in a position to make a judgment about its quality. But let's say let's say you've got the experience. That's that. You know, Mill's going to add the second condition in here too. Let's go back to that setting where me and my friend Anne Marie are going around the room, trying out different wines. We're both experiencing the same wines. But her judgment also seems to be more authoritative than mine. Remember, again, if it's red wine and it's going to my face, I'm happy, right? So I'm not very discriminating about this. But it's not just the discriminating part. I'm kind of less sensitive. And that's the second condition that Mill has in mind. It's not just that I have experience with the thing, but I'm also sensitive to the things that are possibly to be enjoyed or not enjoyed if we're talking about pain. Um, my friend Anne Marie, she's tasting the wine, and she's she's just experiencing more than I am. Even though we're getting the same wine, same sort of taste, she's noticing things about it more than I am. Um, maybe think about this like going to an art museum, and like the longer you look at a painting, like the more things you notice about it, and so you're like more sensitive to what's going on with that painting than if someone just like looked at it for five seconds and then walked away. And they're like, yeah, it was a cool painting. Yeah, it was cool. It was cool. But if you're really like looking at it and seeing everything that's going on there, then it's like you are in maybe a better position to make a judgment about what's going on with that thing. 
So sensitivity matters too. Sensitivity to the possibilities, the affordances for what could be enjoyed or not enjoyed about something. Um, so experience and sensitivity are the two things that we're looking for from an ideal judge. Uh, a common question I get in the, at this point in the lecture is, what happens if two qualified judges have judgments that disagree? Well, you can kind of ask them about it, but um, Mill and Mill definitely thinks you know looking at a lot of judges is not a bad idea. Um, I don't think he'd be opposed to that idea at all. Um, sometimes uh, you could explain it by saying, well, if people who have experienced it and are kind of equally sensitive about all the things that are going on with these things end up having contrary opinions, then maybe that just means that whatever quality difference there is between those two things, it's a negligible one. It's not a big deal. It's way more uh, uh, insightful if you're like, everyone or almost everyone who's experienced these things is like, yeah, it goes this way. Then it's like, okay, that's got to be more significant. That's a more significant quality difference then. Um, also, going just back really quickly to this idea about privilege in the sociological sense, sort of connected with this, um, I think that Mill, from, from reading his stuff and, and trying to get inside his head, I think Mill would actually be happy with saying that most of the time, people who are underprivileged in society are actually in the more privileged position with respect to judging the value of things because they have a better chance of knowing uh, both ways things can happen. So sociology is always fond of saying that privilege is one of those things that's kind of invisible. That's a very often observed aspect to this phenomenon of privilege that most people who have privilege don't notice that they have it. It's, it's kind of invisible and transparent to them. Um, and I agree with that. I think that's right. I think that's right. Um, I've observed the same thing about privilege. Um, and that kind of um, makes you a little more ignorant about what's going on. You're not in the best position to make a judgment about relative values. I'll give you one little anecdotal example. Um, let's talk about education. Mill thinks education is bomb. So he's not trying to make his theory be this sort of thing that's like, here's how... He, it, Mill, in other words, Mill does not think he's the ideal judge on all matters of quality. But he does offer what, what he's got. And he's like, near as I can tell... Education and truth-seeking, he thinks that's a major high-quality pleasure, and relationships with people. Those he thinks are pretty big. He also thinks things like freedom are pretty big, too. Um, very high-quality pleasures. And so they're going to get a real big weight in the utilitarian calculus. Um, but let's take that education one just for a second. Um, I've uh, lived my whole life with education. Um, my parents were teachers. I was homeschooled till third grade put into private education, went through the whole thing, to college, high school, college, uh, graduate school, and now I'm back in school again, teaching even more. So my whole life, all I've known is education. Um, and so I've got a lot of experience with it. But if I wanted to think about like the relative value of education as a part of a human life, I really don't know what it's like on the other end. I mean, there was, there was about a year and a half where uh, between undergraduate and grad school, where I was making a life with not within the context of education. I was still kind of doing things as a student independently. You know, I'd like read stuff and read philosophy and think about stuff. But I do remember it, it kind of sucked. So I, it was kind of like quitting education, like quitting heroin cold turkey or something like that. And I, I, I was kind of depressed for a while because uh, no one wanted to have deep conversations with things. And I was like, oh, that's really hard to do. But anyway, there's some people who are in a better position than me to make a judgment about the relative quality of education. And that's people who have not experienced it or haven't, who have known what it's like to not have access to it. Um, so this anecdotal story actually is courtesy of one of my friends who works at a nonprofit in Seattle called Landessa. And Landessa is a very famous uh, nonprofit. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Uh, it's won a lot of awards. Um, but their main focus is they go to other countries and do a bunch of research and then submit the research to the government and say, do what you want with this research. But the, the research is sort of done, um, it's given for free, you know, it's a nonprofit. Um, but the research is trying to kind of make the evidential case for why it's a good idea, why it'd be good policy to uh, give people ownership of the land that they work on. So that's one thing, land rights. And then also educating women. That's a big thing too for Landessa. And I remember my friend sort of telling me this story 
uh, from their research, like that they find sometimes if uh, women don't already have access to education, that it may not be a high priority for them. That if you ask them, like, do you want to be able to go to school, they're like, nah, not really. Like the the culture that hasn't given them that opportunity might have um, other models of meaning or value sets that they participate with um, where that's not something that they're interested in pursuing. But they also have found that once you just give women access to education, it's very hard to take it away from them later. That after they uh, have had some education, then they start to value it very, very highly. And so much so that they're going to fight to keep it and thus lose or sacrifice on other things that they care about, other values, other possible values, in order to retain that. So that says, like from Mill's sort of use of privilege perspective test, that's going to count for a lot. Because those people have known what it's like to not have access to education, and then they had access to education, and the, what they're willing to prefer, what they would, which values will they choose in favor of from both sides of the, of the possibilities there, uh, if it's such a dramatic, uh, a marked difference like that, then that, that means something about the quality of education. That is, like, I should trust their judgments more than mine because I don't really have the experience of knowing what I'm judging between. I've only known one side of it. They've known both sides of it, and if they are showing such a marked preference for one of them over the other, then that's, that's a big sign to the quality of that pleasure, that value, that form of utility. Okay, so that's a, that's a lot of what I wanted to share about Mills thinking about quality. There's some interesting implications of this that I, I might summarize really quickly, um, but I want to make sure, people in the chat, you can help me out here. Um, how, how's the lecture been going so far in, in helping you get a picture of what is this quality thing that that Mill is trying to capture, um, and how could we gain an understanding of it uh, through, the, the, through this privilege perspective test? How's that going? Cool. Thank you for the feedback. So I've been making pretty good sense so far. Have there been anything that, any questions popping up? Anything I might be able to clarify a little bit more? Okay, it's kind of looking like no. Please let me know if the answer is no, too. <laughs> uh, more feedback helps. Kind of lets me know whether I should be waiting or, or not waiting. Okay, it sounds like things are going good. Um, silence is always hard to interpret. Thank you for those of you who, who did give me some feedback. I appreciate that. Okay, um... So what are, what are some of the implications of this? Well, for one thing, if Mill's right in these suppositions that the only reason why we have differences in what we value is because of our different experiences, then that kind of like sets up the possibility of hope for getting some universal answers um, because maybe we can learn from each other's experience and then get a better idea of what value things have. Just the same way, sort of reflects again back to us, how we look at the things we valued when we were younger and we are like, yeah, maybe that's not so valuable. This stuff is way more important. Now I've got a better idea. You know, I, I didn't need to be so concerned about whether that was going to happen in my life because there's this stuff that's much, much more important. So um, there's this opportunity for learning about happiness that we can deepen in our understanding of it. And knowing what's the really important stuff and what stuff is maybe not as high of a priority. And we gain a better idea of that the more experience we have and the more that we learn from each other and people who have experience that's different from ours. Um, 
So that's that's kind of part of why I like to describe Mill as, as a big hippie, um, that he has this kind of dream of how we're all exploring this human thing. You know, it's not fundamentally different from person to person. Uh, what is fundamentally different is that we just have access to different parts of the story. We've explored different parts, swaths of the territory. Um, but we're all on the same world. We're all on the same map of possibilities. Um, some people really disagree with that way of thinking about human nature and human experience, but this is where Mill's coming from about it. Um, the other cool thing about this is that um, Mill thinks, well, okay, so this is maybe a little bit more about Mill's understanding of quality from informed from his experience. But for his experience and what he sort of is like, if you ask me kind of thing, like if, he, if Mill did the hat turning thing, because he's providing a general theory for everybody. It's not just based on his personal experience and opinion. Um, but when it comes to that, like what is he going to contribute to that discussion? For his own part, he says that he thinks the higher quality pleasures are not the things that require uh, or as are as dependent on limited resources. And he thinks that's a pretty significant deal. That he, he thinks um, there's really no reason why we can't stop global hunger. And actually, uh, one of the philosophers slash economists who I have a reading selection in this first unit from, uh, M. Yarda Sen, won his Nobel Peace Prize in economics precisely for showing, basic, effectively, that we could end world hunger in, I think, something like three or four months without building any new economic infrastructure. Like that all that it would require is the political will and here's how you could organize it and make it happen and boom, we just have that problem solved. And that's kind of how Mill thinks too. He's like, there's no reason why people need to be suffering to the degree that they are. It's just stupid organization and a lack of concern. If we were utilitarians and really concerned about each other's happiness, the same that we're concerned about our own happiness, um, this isn't a zero-sum game. It's not like there have to be some losers in order for them to there to be some winners, especially when you take into account that the higher quality pleasures, the ones that are really going to make the splash in the utilitarian calculus, are for things that require almost no resources at all, that have like universal access, positive human relationships, uh, education. It doesn't even have to be like formal education. You have to shell out all this money for. I mean, if we really valued education as a society, we could completely restructure how it exists as a social institution where it wouldn't be so uh, restrictive based on the high costs that are involved in the way the market is set up for e higher education. I mean, what we're doing right now is not a necessary or inevitable result for what makes education possible, including Bellevue College. And Bellevue College is trying really, I think, pretty sincerely, um, not maybe, I don't know if I'd give them a complete pass on this one, but it's been a mandate of the school to make quality education accessible to students who otherwise have a harder time doing that, um, maybe because of financial position or something like that. So we've been trying to keep costs for students low. Tuition keeps getting raised, and that's where I'm like, maybe we could be doing a better job of this, um, and the schools pr could make that maybe more of a priority. But in terms of the whole school system, not just with one school, but all of them, if we really cared about it, we could make a huge overhaul to how our society treats that. And Mill's not even thinking about education just in terms of formal education, but just like access to libraries. I mean, Mill honestly would really, I mean, if he knew about the internet, he'd just be like, this is great. And we should take all the books, put them on the internet for free, and let people read them. Like all the old like classics and textbooks and things like that. Make education like as accessible as possible, and people will live much happier lives. Um, these are things that can happen. So that's kind of interesting. Um, Mill, Mill really believes that if we had a better understanding of what happiness really is, that a lot of these fights about, uh, like political fights over economic power um, and basically politics motivated from economics, um, we'd see a huge declining in conflict because people wouldn't be so desperate to be getting more money because they don't need the money to be happy. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, but that's so. That's kind of how Mill thinks the whole quality game is going to shake out. Uh, another thing which makes me sort of 
think he's like a hippie, right? He's got hippie-ish sorts of ideals. 19th century dude. Ahead of his time. Um, what else here? Um, so quality... Oh, here's the other big thing. By making quality an objective property, Mill also gives some more teeth to the idea that I can make choices about what things I actually do care about that could maximize utility better. So utilitarianism sometimes gets, I think, strawmanned into accepting people's existing preferences as sacrosanct, and it does give everything a pass. I mean, if, if you care about it, boom, it gets in the utilitarian calculus, right? Uh, uh, like we've remarked on before. Um, but with the objective quality thing in there, it's like, well, hey, some of the choices I make end up affecting my own psychology, my own desires. Like, if I start shooting up heroin every night before this lecture, pretty soon I'm going to be addicted to heroin. <laughs> like, it's not going to take very long. My psyche is going to be altered. My desires are going to be altered by uh, subjecting myself to those experiences. Um, and this happens in a multitude of ways. Um, Buddhism might want to step in here a little bit. They have a lot of things to say about this uh, and how your actions end up changing your character. Uh, that's really all that they mean by karma traditionally, not some metaphysical force um, that balances things out. But uh, for traditional Buddhists, all karma means is just when you act, you affect yourself as a part of the consequence of your action, not just the external circumstances uh, that your behavior is engaging with, but you end up acting on yourself. Um, and that will change you, and it'll change what you care about. So if I'm able to, let's say I'm the sadist, and I'm like, man, me being a sadist doesn't work out well for the utilitarian calculus. Either I'm going to go unhappy because I'm not causing pain to others, or I get my pleasure but at the expense of other people's pain. So that's not a, that's not a very good win-win scenario, right? It's always my happiness or theirs. Ugh. But if I recognize, hey, if I was able to care about life in ways that are not restricted to just sadism, then that would work out better for the utilitarian calculus. Like, fancy that. If I can find a way to change my character so that I genuinely take pleasure in other people's happiness, that their happiness makes me happy too, that's way better at maximizing utility. I should do that. It gives me direction on how to shape my own character too. Utilitarianism does that. Again, makes me think hippies, right? You're like, I, I want to be a person who does be happy in other people's happiness. That makes that integrates compassion as something that's not just self-sacrificing my happiness for the sake of others, but um, that I can be happy in that too. Now, that all that said, definitely utilitarianism is, uh, to be a good utilitarian, you have to be comfortable with sacrifice. Uh, I mean, compromising your own maximizing of utility for the sake of maximizing utility overall, that's going to be a ubiquitous component of being a utilitarian. At least compromising, uh, instead of, um, <laughs> there's a contemporary utilitarian in the late 20th century who talks about straight maximizers and constrained maximizers. So he's kind of like, people are generally selfish. But there's a difference between someone who's like, everything's about me and everyone else can go to hell versus someone who's like, well, I'm concerned about my happiness. Um, I'm not just going to like sell all my possessions and give all the money to a nonprofit or something and then just die. That's not a thing that maximizes utility. But uh, So there's a concern about my own utility. But I'm definitely going to be sacrificing some of my possible happiness to acknowledge what and respect what's going on for people around me, um, but I actually I actually think utilitarianism is I, I don't want to make it sound like it's too easy to be a utilitarian. Maximizing utility means a degree of egolessness that is very very difficult for human beings to do. Um, but the theory does give us guidance on how to shape our character too using the utilitarian calculus. If someone was trying to like force themselves into taking pleasure in other people's happiness like in a way that's destructive like maybe trying to guilt themselves into it or shame themselves into it that's not going to maximize utility either so the utilitarian can be pretty sophisticated in how they 
measure all the different consequences of taking one course of action or another. So it, that that's something that helps utilitarianism defend itself against objections because uh, it means there's a lot of resources to draw on. Um, for I mean, there's a lot of ways that a hasty rejection of utilitarianism is in danger of straw manning it because it has a lot to say. Okay, so that's enough about quality. I spent way too much time talking about that. <laughs> um, but hopefully you've got a really good picture of it. I, in some ways, the extended discussion of quality is going to help us understand the next step of the lecture. And what I want to do next is talk about um, Mill's way of trying to justify utilitarianism. Um, we, I guess we've kind of been getting into how he's trying to justify uh, judgments about quality. And there'll be a kind of a similar thing going on for justifying the whole theory. Um, it won't be an argument from authority, but it will be a subjectivist appeal. So we'll see that. Um, there's going to be. I'm going to bring up the uh, whiteboard here, and then and then we'll take a little break. But I want to, for those of you in the chat, give you an idea where we're going. Um, let's go back to uh, this. Okay, and. I'm going to draw a different picture now. Um, imagine another map. This is a map of value. And there are things that we value for the sake of other things. So I'm, I'm drawing this value like this. So like we value money as a means, not uh, not as an end in itself, but as a means for other ends. So is money a good thing? Yeah, we'd say money is a good thing. Um, but why? Yeah, well, unless we're Scrooge McDuck, uh, we don't just care about having it for having its sake. We care about it for what it can buy us, that we think what money can buy us is something good and valuable. And why do we think those things are good? Maybe for the sake of something else. So you might, I might ask you, like, is it good to take this class on business ethics? And you might say, yeah. And I might be like, why? And you might be like, well, I need to take it in order to get my degree. And then I'd ask you, why is that good? And you're like, well, my degree is going to help me uh, have a career that I want to. And why do you, why would that be good? And so on and so forth. Eventually, this is going to have to stop with something. It's going to have to, the why questions end somewhere. Um, there's some ultimate end or ultimate goal, or Mill calls it a first principle of morality, of ethics, that sort of talks about what's intrinsically good. In Mill's uh, defense of utilitarianism, utilitarianism is basically saying, you want to know what the ultimate good is? Actually, here, let's not make this look ugly as shit. Um, you want to know what the ultimate good is? It's utility. I cannot spell one-handed okay there we go utility utility is the ultimate good um, it's something we value for its own sake uh, and everything else gets its value because it promotes utility so this was like when I was describing earlier utility is the common currency it's uh, this um, currency of value that everything else that has value has value in terms of utility the first argument Mill's going to offer, the main argument for justifying utilitarianism, is to argue that utility truly is this universal value that is relevant for everything else that's the rest of this kind of pyramid thing. So everything else that has value <clears throat> gets its value from the context of utility. It's a, Mill calls it a universal condition of morality. In the second step of the argument that I'm going to describe, for you tonight, um, Mill's going to try to show that utility not only is a universal condition of morality, but it's the only one. It's not sharing the throne with any other values. And that's another possibility. Um, it's possible that when it comes to things of ultimate and intrinsic value, there are many of them. Aristotle's going to talk about this too. He's like, when we're inquiring after ultimate ends or the chief good, um, we don't know whether it's going to be one or many. If it's one, cool. Then that's the kind of one standard for everything else's value. If it's many, then that just means there's a few of them in balance. And there have been many philosophers uh, who have offered moral theories that are more like pluralistic, just meaning that they have more than one ultimate good. 
Um, utilitarianism isn't that way. It's saying everything comes under the umbrella of utility. It's not to say these other things don't value, don't have value. They do have value, but they just have value in as much as they promote utility. Utility is the common, the common universal standard for everything else. So that's what we'll that's what we'll be um, discussing more here after uh, we take a, a little break. Okay. So those of you watching on YouTube, it'll be like no break at all but um, for those of you in the chat I'm just gonna take a couple minutes here and stretch my face catch my breath and uh, while we're doing the break maybe think about if you have any questions from what I've been talking about so far and we can touch base again before um, going on to more material okay all right so part one of Mill's project of defending utilitarianism is going to be trying to show that utility is a universal condition for morality. That means no matter what we're talking about, and it's uh, things that we think are good or bad or right and wrong, everything is going to need to be held uh, underneath the sort of master measuring stick of utility. And I, I like this measuring stick metaphor. So like, uh, take something I mentioned I think early on in the lecture on Mill, that um, Mill is motivated to create a moral theory that could help us uh, figure out whether laws still make sense. Like times change, uh, maybe the law should change with it. Or maybe the law, the laws that we have are not things that depend on um, certain contingent circumstances but are still very relevant to our moral life. And that's not always determined solely by just people's uh, what's in vogue or how culture has adapted or something like that. Um, sometimes um, things from uh, an older culture might, they shouldn't be lost, right? So, but how would we tell? How do we know when we need to change the laws and when we don't? So Mill's looking for a higher court of appeal, something that could work as a universal standard. So think of the law as like a measuring stick or a cultural value as a measuring stick. It is we've got these concepts and ideas of values that help us weigh scenarios and be like should I do this or should I do this how are they measuring with this measuring stick but then those measuring sticks might need their own measuring sticks and that's where we get back to this pic picture like I was drawing um, on my little whiteboard with uh, the the pyramid right the um, let me build this back up you know these there could be measuring sticks from culture from my personal sense of ethics or from uh, government or something like that but what's the ultimate standard that everything is held accountable to Mill wants that to be utility now how's he gonna argue for this well that's tricky let's uh, let's stop the whiteboard and I actually this is where I'm gonna start going from the Mill lecture 2 notes uh, for those of you who are following along with the lecture notes here's where uh, I'm gonna start getting into lecture 2 um, and before we talk about how Mill's going to attempt this positively, let's talk about how he doesn't want to do it. What are, what are the sorts of possible ways of justifying a moral theory that he thinks are not appropriate? So there's a couple. There's a couple things that he, he mostly targets. One of them is pure reason. Um, reason all by itself. Uh, logic and rationality could maybe settle this stuff for us. Mill's really skeptical of that. Uh, you know who's not skeptical of that? Kant. That's exactly what Kant wants to do. And we'll talk about Kant later. Maybe, uh, probably not tonight, too. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, man, it's hard to get Mill done faster. But we'll talk about Kant next week. Kant's going to exactly try to do that. He's going to try to pull a rabbit out of a hat. He's going to try to get uh, universal objective values out of reason alone, logic alone. Mill's writing after Kant. So he knows about Kant, and he knows about Kant's influence in his theory and his thought uh, and the powerful arguments that he has. I, I kind of get the sense from reading Mill that um, he doesn't maybe understand Kant very deeply. Some of the objections he makes to Kant seem superficial, but or make Kant into a kind of a straw man, but we're going to be doing Kant in great, robust detail, so you'll be able to kind of make a judgment for yourself. Um, but Mill thinks uh, you can't do that, that reason can't help. And here's why. Go back to the pyramid thing. If I say this thing is valuable for this reason, 
When I offer a reason for why this is valuable, I'm really just setting a value above it. And that's fine. We do that. Like in the map, you saw me drawing the arrows with the things pointing up. But when it comes to first principles, Mill says there cannot be a proof for first principles. You can't do it. Why? Because as soon as you give a reason for why the first principle matters, you're just setting up a new first principle. You're just pushing that pyramid higher up. That wherever, and now you just change the position. Whatever's at that top can never get an argument because as soon as you make an argument, boom, you've got another thing above it. There's an endless regress here. So this, this is kind of a classic paradox for, for meta-ethical discussions about moral justification. And, but Mill thinks he's got a way around this, but it's not going to be through reason. So reasons, reason gets us into this regress. That's a problem. Now, reason is going to play a pretty pivotal role in Mill's argument, but not at the start. Kind of the way uh, I could probably summarize this informally or uh, as quickly as possible would be to say uh, reason can't pull this rabbit out of a hat, can't pull first principles out of nowhere. Um, so you need something else to get the ball rolling. And then reason can help you corral that, right? Or try to make sure you're staying consistent on it or something. But you need something else to kind of get things started. You, um, reason can't start the discussion all by itself. Uh, it might provide the form, but it's not going to provide the content. Okay. Um, so reason will play a role, but just not a foundational role for, for Mill. Uh, then there's another opponent here. And this is probably the more common one you might have in mind. We're like, how do we make decisions? What you know? What's the highest court of appeal for judgments about like different moral perspectives or what's good and bad and right and wrong? You might say your conscience. That's how I figure this stuff out. I consult my conscience. And what is your conscience? Your conscience is a set of intuitions. And what are intuitions? Well, intuitions are a kind of feeling that you have, like a like a gut feeling um, about. Yeah, that sounds right. That that doesn't sound right. That mm, smells like injustice to me. That I think that's what should have happened, right? So they're kind of these feelings, right? Um, now Mill doesn't have a problem with them because they're feelings. What he is concerned about with this intuitionist approach, a conscience approach to moral epistemology, is that he thinks it's arbitrary. That basically what's going on here, if you put your stock in intuitions as a way to try to justify a moral position, is that you're picking and choosing which of all the feelings that you feel that you're going to give some moral authority to. Think about it kind of like the angel on one shoulder and the demon on the other. I'm having really weird deja vu. Did I talk about this on Tuesday already? Chat, help me out. You remember the angel demon thing? Okay, okay, maybe I'm maybe that's just a little wires getting crossed in my brain. Okay, so if you think about your conscience like Jiminy Cricket, like this little angel on your shoulder being like, you should treat people nice. And then there's a demon on your other voice who's like, eh, you don't care about them, screw them or something. Um, you, you, you've got feelings that you associate with your conscience, and you've got feelings that you might categorize as like temptations. Uh, or feelings that you don't give moral authority to, that you might think are morally illegitimate, so you don't listen to those voices. Mill's like, fine, but how do you tell which is which? And Mill's like, I've never heard a good argument for someone giving me like a principled line in the sand here of, here's what makes those feelings appropriate to give moral authority to, and why these ones shouldn't be given it. So he's worried that we kind of arbitrarily pick and choose these things. And that is not that far from, say, a related concern of how much, I hear this a lot from people, that you're worried about trusting intuitions because you might be worried they're biased. Okay? That they're, they're basically informed from uh, cultural standards or how you were raised or what religious tradition you have access to or exposure to or all this kind of stuff. And that there's not uh, any particular reason why you'd say, like, your conscience is a faculty of perceiving moral truths, especially when we see how different people have intuitions that really differ from each other. So Mill's really skeptical about that approach. He doesn't want to ground his moral theory on intuitional appeals. Um, 
because he's worried about arbitrary picking and choosing. But now take a look at the lecture notes. I've got um, on the first page here, I've underlined sentimentalism, parentheses, metaethics. And I define it, sentimentalism, as all justification of moral beliefs is grounded in emotions. And we'll refer to emotions here as sentiments. So sentimentalism, whoa, sentimentalism is the position that all justification of moral claims comes from our feelings. But feelings in a way where we're not going to pick and choose one way or the other. And my baby is crying, and I will step aside for just one second. Sorry. All right, so I was a little distracted after helping my son. Um, but I think where I was just leaving off was Mill doesn't like intuitions because they're picking and choosing, but he wants to go for the sentimentalism thing, that all justification for moral claims comes from our feelings. But the thing that's different here, I mean, that, that might sound a lot like intuitionism. Here's the difference. Under Mill's sentimentalism, we're not discriminating about the feelings. The feelings all are legitimate. Doesn't matter what they are. Um, we're not going to prejudge. We're not going to be picking the winners and losers here uh, ahead of time. If you've got feelings about it, boom, there's evidence. Now, this might seem like a free-for-all. Um, and exactly why a lot of people are worried that once you take the subjectivist route, there's no way to avoid relativism. If uh, feelings are the evidence or authority for moral judgments, and we all have different feelings, then you're not going to get an objective theory out of that, right? It's not going to, they're not going to be universal judgments. Um, but wait a second, maybe there could be. So let's take a look at Mill's argument here. And I've got it broken down on the um, lecture notes, and I actually think I'm going to do another screen sharing thing for those of you in the chat, because this is, uh, this is pretty important um, for following what's going on here. And I'm skipping some stuff, but that's okay. I'm trying to do this fast. Or more efficiently, let's say that. <laughs> um, okay, so here we go. You see these uh, bullet points I got here, how this is all supposed to work. So um, each bullet point you can think of as kind of like a premise in an argument. There's like a chain of reasoning going on here. Um, and some of the premises in the argument are not very uh, controversial. They're things that pretty much every ethicist agrees to. But the ones that are underlined, these are the, there's three of them. And those are the ones that are really crucial for um, making Mill's argument work. And they're the things that people challenge and offer objections to. So first let's talk about, uh, just let's just start at the beginning. So Mill says, questions about ethics are about ends. And what we mean by ends are kind of the ultimate goals of life. Um, this is why uh, talking about ethics is really talking about the meaning of life. Um, those are one and the same things. If people are talking about the meaning of life, they're talking about ethics. Because they're talking about what's the ultimate stuff that's good and important. The stuff at the top of that pyramid. Okay, um, Ends as opposed to means. Right? Means are things that are valuable because of the end that they produce, but they're not valuable in and of themselves. Okay, next, and that's not controversial. So questions about ends, if we're talking about ends as a concept here, that logically just means that we're talking about questions about what is desirable. And what I mean by desirable is what we ought to desire. Uh, in other words, what has value. Um, what actually has value, right? Um, if we value it, that value is appropriate if the thing that we're valuing actually has value. And it would be inappropriate, we'd be wrong about this, if we valued something that doesn't have actually value. So desirable here is an objective property. Okay, now here's where sentimentalism shows up, this theory of sentimentalism that Mill's agreeing to, that really starts to do some work. And this is a very controversial claim. So if sentimentalism is true, if, like we've got up here, all justification of moral beliefs is grounded in our sentiments, in our emotions and feelings, then that allows us to connect what has value, what is desirable, like we were just talking about, with what we actually desire. So in other words, um, what is good is just what our feelings tell us is good. It's, it's what we actually desire, what we care about. That, that's our guide to it. 
Now, um, there's a big tangent I go on usually when I'm teaching my ethical theory class and we're doing Mill here, but I don't think that Mill is saying with sentimentalism that all it means to say that something has value is to say that you value it, that you to say something is desirable is just to say that it is desired. I think what Mill is saying with sentimentalism is that what we desire is evidence or a guide, but not a proof <clears throat> for what has value. So it's it's our guide. So that's why I have here to kind of summarize the first movement of the argument here. What is actually desired by us um, is our guide to what our ends ought to be, right? What is worth pursuing? Um, what our life should revolve around. Okay, now um, sentimentalism, I, we should note, does not mean utilitarianism wins in the debate about what ethical theory is correct. Um, there have been many sentimentalists in the history of philosophy that are opposed to utilitarianism or that advocate for a different type of moral theory. Um, so just saying that um, our feelings, our sentiments are the things that count as evidence in this debate is not an automatic win for utilitarianism, not without some other premises. So let's get to that. Next premise. This is a big one. Another big move. Um, Mill thinks there's this empirical observation that tells us, ostensibly, that something is universally desired. In other words, there's something that we all care about. Um, and this is, I'm going to stop here for a second, because pause, pause for a moment, because this is a really big claim that Mill makes. Mill thinks we got disagreements about what's good, um, but our disagreement our disagreements are about all these like different objects of goodness, different things that we desire. But Mill thinks that all of us agree that there's something that has value, and, and this is not one of the things that's different from person to person. Every single person who has ever lived and valued anything, who has had any desires at all, counts it as a good if they get what they want. And if they don't get what they don't want, in other words, utility, preference satisfaction, we always, all of us, think it's good when we get our utility met, when we get what we want. The only thing that's different between us is what we want. But we all think it's good if we get what we want. And this might seem like a cheap trick, and there have been many philosophers who have thought it is. Um, but this is, I'm just going to kind of give it to you straight. This is what Mill, Mill thinks um, is kind of the linchpin here. Um, we, we don't have endless disagreements about everything fundamentally. There's something that we're all on the same page about, and that's our own utility. We all desire and value our own utility. Um, it's a common denominator. Okay, So no matter what you care about, you would count it as a good if you got what you wanted. Now, there's something else we should say about this. It's pretty important for the next step. When I count it as good, when I get what I want, we're not necessarily talking about egoism here or selfishness. Okay, um, We're not saying that everyone else can go to hell or something. Uh, I don't care what happens to them. We're just saying, Mill, Mill thinks that what we all agree to is that it is objectively good when I get what I want. So it's kind of like saying, when I get what I want, good has happened. And it's not really tied specifically with me. It just so happens that everyone does value their own utility. And this is true, arguably, even for people who are uh, maybe potential counterexamples or might look like counterexamples, like people who um, think that their desires should not be met or that have like uh, like low self-esteem or very self-deprecating or something like that. Um, Mill would probably say about those people in those situations that um, there, you still have preferences here. You think you have a preference that these other preferences shouldn't be met. Kind of like the alcoholic who hates themselves. Right? They have a preference to drink alcohol, but they have another preference that they shouldn't be wanting to drink alcohol. Right? And so uh, they would count it as good if they could do what they can't right? because of the addiction. Addiction is complicated, much more complicated than that, and we're actually going to talk about that more with Kant. Addiction is a very good case example for explaining Kant's ethics. But anyway, um, to get back on track here, uh, 
Mill, the next step of Mill's argument is to say there is something that is a universal value. Now, this doesn't get us utilitarianism, because remember, utilitarianism is saying we need to be maximizing everybody's utility, not just our own. But at this, if the argument just stopped here, all we really got an argument for is that everyone is concerned about themselves. Everyone is interested in maximizing their own utility, but it's not necessarily has a reason for caring about anyone else just yet. So we need one more step. Let's go back to the, the notes. Okay, so the final step here is this generalization step. This universal desire, there is something we all universally care about. That provides the grounding or, or authority for an ethical law once we generalize it. So what do I mean by that? What do I mean by this generalizing step? Um, okay, actually, that was just a short little interlude back with the notes because I want to talk to you more. So um, there is something that's a universal value because there's something that's universally desired. There's something universally desirable because it is universally desired. Uh, so if we have disagreements in our feelings about particular objects of, like, the particular desires that we've got, you like it, I don't, um, we won't be able to resolve that universally. Oh, pardon me. I'm going to sneeze. Let me mute my microphone. Um, mute. <coughs> Whew. Hmm. Ooh. Oh no, I only muted it. <laughs> I only muted it for the chat. Uh, sorry, those of you watching on YouTube. I uh, just got a loud sneeze. At least there was warning. Um, what was I saying? Sneeze just blanked my brain. God, it's getting late. Um, no apologies. No excuses. Oh, brain. Universal value, because it's universally desired. Uh, oh, right, right, right. So if we have different desires about different things in different ways, then those feelings can't be taken as ultimate evidence for what's universally true, because it's not universally shared, right? It's a subjectivity that's contingent. But if there's a subjectivity that's universal, maybe we can use that as a basis for a universal law. Or we could. Mill, Mill's just going to say we can. Okay. But up to this point, the only thing we could say is a universal value is that everyone's concerned about their own utility. Here's how Mill's going to try to get the part about everyone's utility mattering. It's not just that everyone does care about their own utility, but it, there's this is where reason's going to play its important role. Mill wants to kind of argue like this. If all of us, let's say for you, if, or I, I'll use it myself. If I count it as a good when I get what I want, and I'm not thinking about that specifically as Tim Lineman, but just, I'm just thinking objective good has happened if my preferences are satisfied. Preference satisfaction is a good in my case. If I want, want to somehow say, well, I don't have to be concerned about other people and their utility and their preference satisfaction that I'm basically drawing a line in my in the sand that says, well, when my preferences are satisfied, that's a good. But when yours are satisfied, that good has not happened. If you wanted to defend that position, you're going to have to rationally justify what makes for the normative asymmetry here. If something is sometimes good and sometimes not good, then what's the morally relevant difference there? Or what's the normative difference there? And Mill thinks there's no good rational argument you could give for this. There's no principle that would justify why I could say it's good when I get what I want, but it's not good when you get what you want. So it's by a kind of rational extension of the feelings I have about myself, recognizing other people have the same feelings, that I'm sort of committed logically to being concerned about everyone's utility. If I... Uh, am not concerned about everyone's utility and equal to my own utility, then I'm just being irrational, which we are, and Mill is happy to acknowledge humans are irrational, but that doesn't make it right. And in terms of justifying a moral theory, we can say the ideal thing to do here, I mean, there, I, there's no argument to justify not treating everyone's utility equally. Okay, there's no way to do this that can be supported. Um, 
so that's that's kind of a that's a, a significant thing. There's some more debate that can happen there, but that's kind of how Mill's approaching it. So at that point, now we do have an argument for the principle of utility, and that's all it means to be a utilitarian. So if Mill's argument is accepted at this point, then he's been able to justify utility as a universal condition of morality, something that's relevant to every choice you ever have to make, figuring out what's right and wrong, good and bad. The buck stops with utility, and utility conceived of as a universal phenomenon for everybody. Okay, so that's step one of the proof. Uh, chat, how's it going? Any questions about step one before I dive into step two? Okay. Wonderful. Cool. I ha I'm happy it's going well. Okay, so for picking up for part two, um, I mentioned the, the game plan here is Mill wants to show that utility is a universal value, and then he wants to show it's the only one. There's, it's not sharing the throne with anything else. There's no balancing act of multiple fundamental values here. There's just one. It's utility and nothing more. So everything else that has value, everything else we think is good, is good because it promotes utility. It's underneath it. Okay, So utility is at the top of the pyramid, everything else below it. It's the top priority. Okay, how is he going to argue for that? Well, his method here is to look at other values that other philosophers have have set up as fundamental conditions of morality kind of other competing ethical systems um, and then try to show how the support for them uh, which is going to be judged based on feelings right all arguments for um, normative claims come from our feelings under sentimentalism that's the sort of rules of engagement and debate according to Mill um, that's going to be uh, we're going to look at the sentiments behind these competitors, and Mill's going to try to show how the feelings which back up why we would, we might find these as plausible ethical theories is because of feelings that really are rooted in a value on utility. So one way I can kind of describe what's going to happen here is Mill's going to take one of these competing values, like say virtue. Virtue is going to be one of the ones he talks about. He's going to be like, virtue looks like something different, right? It's got some heft to it got some moral weight why does it have that weight let's crack it open and see inside oh look at that look at what's inside it's got this metal core of utility that's where all the weights coming from the feelings that are sort of backing it up are really utilitarian in character so it's kind of like take any moral value you like prick it and it bleeds utility right that's the real thing that gives uh, the weight to it for us subjectively and this is really important for understanding Mill's logic. It's not Mill saying, this is my opinion about it. I think we should value stuff this way. I think we should value stuff in terms of utility. His real argument is like, you, you people, you people who value virtue or justice, these are going to be the two ones he's going to talk about, you value it this way. You're really a utilitarian. You just don't maybe realize that. And I'm just showing that to you. Okay? And that's really Mill's argument. Every, the reason why utilitarianism is the fundamental ethical theory and nothing else is that everything, all the other options, all of us, are always utilitarians. That's where it gets its authority from. It's still subjective, right? It's still stance-dependent. That's in the world of human subjectivity. But there's a universal pattern to it. It's just we're all utilitarians. That's Mill's argument. Um, I don't know if there's any Star Trek fans out there, but... Not not everyone's watches Star Trek anymore. I'm a big Star Trek fan. Uh, really good good philosophy in it for the most part. Um, but I kind of relate. Uh, yeah, yeah, I relate um, Mill's version of utilitarianism, and this might not be the most fair comparison, but he's kind of like the Borg. He wants to assimilate all other moral theories to the pattern of utilitarianism. Um, but it's kind of like I mean, the Borg do this by force, right? They 
go out and make people like them. Um, build them in, add their distinctiveness to their own. But for Mill, he's kind of saying, like, everyone already is a Borg. You just might not have realized it. You're, you're already plugged in. So that's going to be the that's a brief description of the overall strategy here. So Mill is dealing with two principal opponents. Um, a value, like if, if we were going to put something else up there with utility, what might we do? Well, we might choose virtue, and we might choose justice. And there might be some other ones here too, um, but I think um, Mill would try the same strategy on them that he's going to try with these two. So we'll talk about the ones that he talks about, um, but there might be some more things. And, you know, Mill is not the last word on this discussion. There's huge amounts of books and papers that have been written since this, and utilitarianism is still a very popular and ubiquitous uh, moral theory today. So there's a lot more to say about this. But to get us started, let's let's look at what Mill, Mill talks about with virtue and justice. Um, what does it look like to value virtue? What are we talking about there? Well, a, if we're going to elevate the concept of virtue to a universal condition of morality, then we're basically saying what ethics is all about is being a good person. And what it means to be a good person is to have ideal character traits. So having virtues and not having vices, that's what it means to, uh, to live ethically, is to live the way an ethical person would. Right, so we're defining uh, as our master measuring stick the characteristics of people, not certain behaviors and their consequences like utilitarianism does. So it's a it's a little different model for how to think about moral choice, um, based on these idealized character traits. Very very common. I mean, virtue ethics has been, it was kind of the dominant uh, way of thinking about ethics in the ancient Greek world where Western philosophy kind of starts. Um, but it, you find virtue ethics everywhere at this time period, earlier time periods. It's been a very popular option, uh, and still is actually. Virtue ethics has got a kind of had a resurgence in the last 20 years in contemporary philosophy. There's been a lot more enthusiasm for it lately. Um, to show you how Mill wants to use this strategy with virtue, he kind of uses case examples. I'm going to kind of give an updated version of it that sort of fits modern times. So, of course, Mill wouldn't talk this way but or wouldn't use an example like this. But I think it does a pretty good job. So, Mill's going to try to show us that the feelings that we have that support our value on uh, virtue are not really supporting it as a universal value and they support it with really a concern about utility. Um, so the sentiments that back up the reason why we might even be tempted to think of virtue as a, something to ground an ethic on really comes from feelings that are about utility. So that shows utility is the real deep down value. That's the thing that virtue is contingent on. Okay. So how's he going to prove this? Well, he uses a he he's going to be like here's a, here's a virtue. The virtue gets talked about a lot. A willingness to sacrifice your good for the sake of other people, this kind of compassion, right? Uh, but a, a compassion that has a cost, and you've got such a strength of character, you're such a good person that you put others before yourself when it makes sense to do so. So um, let me give you this kind of example. Um, like this willingness to self-sacrifice is, is the virtue, to, to deprioritize your own good for the sake of others. So here's a scenario. Oh, and by the way, Mill thinks, he's like, I can run the same game with any virtue you like. It's going to show up the same way. This is just one example. It doesn't prove everything. But he's like, I'm pretty confident I'll be able to do this with any possible virtue. So you can think about that critically for yourself if you want. But here's a story we get. Uh, effect effectively something like this. Say I'm walking down the street, and uh, I see a kid playing with a ball. Ball goes out in the street. Kid follows afterward. I look over. Truck's coming down the road. Truck sees the kid slamming on the brakes, but I know it's not going to be in time. I rush out into the street. I throw the kid to safety. Get hit by the truck and die. You know what? What's the what's the news going to say about me on that evening? You know, evening news. What are they going to say? They're going to be like, "What a hero!" You know, what amazing virtue. And maybe people watching the story and finding out about what happened to me, they might be like, man, I wouldn't do that, Like, I'm, but I'm just not that virtuous. 
right? I'm, I'm still, I'm like, respect for this person who is willing to do that. Uh, it might be hard to make the choice to do that, but that just might be because you're not that good of a person. <laughs> um, so we, but we'd respect it. We, even if we wouldn't do it ourselves, we'd still have a sense of, of what would be ideal, and we could have pretty, pretty great. We treat it as praiseworthy that I was willing to sacrifice my life to save this kid's life. Pretty cool. Now take a second scenario, very similar to the first. I'm walking down the street, and I see you crossing the street. And there's a truck coming, but, I mean, it's way down the road. I mean, you're going to pass fine. But as you cross the street, your cell phone slips out of your pocket, lands defenseless in the middle of the street. The truck comes, sees the cell phone, slams on the brakes, but I can tell it's not going to be in time. So I rush out into the street, throw your cell phone to safety, and get hit by the truck and die. Now what's the news going to say about me? On the evening news, what are they going to say? They're going to be like, dumbass th throws away his life for a cell phone, right? Or like Florida man or something. It's going to be one of those kinds of jokes. No one's going to treat that as ideal, right? We're going to be like, that's bullshit. That's so dumb. Not what a hero, right? And Mill asks us to reflect. What's the variable that's different between those two scenarios? Why do we value virtue in one case and not in the other? It's the same character trait. I mean, the first observation Mill makes is that if we really cared about this character trait for its own sake, then we'd value it unconditionally. If it's a universal condition of morality, it, its goodness wouldn't depend on anything else. But clearly, there's a contrast here. And what does that contrast depend on? Mill wants to say, it's utility. That's the difference. My life has a lot of utility. Uh, the potential of it, right? I'm throwing away my future. My future has a lot of potential utility connected with it. And if I die, all of that is lost. Um, so that's a big price to pay in utility. But it might be worth it for the sake of the utility of the child. The child has even more life expected, expected life in front of it than me. I'm like 34. Say it's an eight-year-old. Right? They have more life. I mean, I still got plenty of life left too. Hoping, knock on wood. But they definitely have more. And so at, at the very least, it would be like an even trade. And it's probably a positive trade. So the child's life could be worth, in terms of utility, my, my life and its utility. But definitely not the cell phone. I mean, if the cell phone gets destroyed, uh, will that have a utility cost? Yes. I mean, the phone doesn't have any utility for itself or something. It's not a person. But you will be affected. It would suck to have your cell phone destroyed, right? If you had to go go buy a new one, that's a cost to you. It's obnoxious and inconvenient. You'd have to, like, update all your contacts again, get all your apps downloaded that you want. I mean, it would be a pain in the neck. Disutility. Your preferences are not being satisfied if you have to deal with that. But whatever disutility is involved with the loss of your cell phone, it just doesn't hold a candle to a human life. That's just not, that's not the correct price to pay. So Mill says, what's the lesson to learn here? The lesson is that our commitment to virtue as a value, is it a value? Yes, it is a value. But it are the way that we value it, the feelings that are connected with that, are tracking the variable of utility, not virtue for its own sake. So going back to our uh, little um, picture here, uh, this is this will be useful. I like visual stuff. Maybe you do too. Um, if we had, uh, we got virtue over here, virtue, uh, virtue might be a universal value. Mill's going to say no, because what this little, uh, thought experiment has proven is that our value on virtue is contingent on utility. So that means it's prioritized below it. It's not something we value in itself as a universal condition of everything else being good. We care about it for the sake of utility. And again, it's not something Mill's saying. It's not saying that's what I value. He's saying that's what you value. People who like virtue ethics, those of you who are like fans of virtue, this is how you're valuing it. You're really a utilitarian. All right, so this is the same argument Mill's gonna use with justice too, although the story about justice is a little more complicated. Uh, in fact, Mill thinks um, the justice value 
it's like another one of those possible fundamental values at the top of the pyramid. He thinks it's he he says in the, in the reading, um, I'm not quoting this probably perfectly, but it's the only serious obstacle. This concept of justice is the only serious obstacle preventing the universal acceptance of the doctrine of utilitarianism. And he is not opposed to the concept of justice as something that doesn't morally matter. He thinks it matters a lot and very deeply, but not as a fundamental value. And if we think about justice as a fundamental value, sparks are going to fly with utilitarianism. And let me talk about why. Um, first off, uh, this is probably worth saying. The word justice means a lot of different things. And Mill is savvy to this. He's like, I hear people talk about justice so many different ways. In my lecture notes, I got a list of them. It could be like law-given rights. It could be like moral rights. It could be like retributive justice, like eye for an eye, getting what you deserve sort of thing. You could think about justice as fairness or equality or a kind of egalitarianism. Um, you could also think about it in terms of promise-making and promise-keeping, like social contract theories of justice. There's all these different ideas out there that people have in mind when they use the word justice. Mill wants to kind of boil that down a little bit, and I think he's right to do so. Uh, I don't really like his definition of justice, ultimately, but for the context of an opponent for utilitarianism, I think his definition is getting exactly at what's the theoretical problem for him. The, so for Mill, when Mill's talking about justice here, for the purposes of his discussion, sorry, I have to... It's a long lecture sitting in this chair. I've got to rearrange my body. For the purpose of Mill and utilitarianism, justice is going to be like a, a model of moral reasoning. It's going to be like a certain way of conceptualizing the moral landscape, which is fundamentally at odds with utilitarianism's way of, of carving it up. Um, remember again, if you're a utilitarian, you don't think any behavior is fundamentally off limits. Uh, the utilitarian, if they're going to ask, hey, is this behavior morally okay or not okay? They're always going to say, it depends. It depends on the circumstances. Does that course of action maximize utility versus the other options or not? That's the only rule. And, it, and it's a rule, the rule to maximize utility doesn't tell you anything definitive about certain types of behavior in all possible circumstances. It always says, it depends. And it gives a clear answer about what it depends upon, maximizing utility. So that's great. Um, but the way Mill is going to define justice is a way of conceptualizing moral phenomenon that involves necessary rules that do not admit of exceptions. So something being always right or always wrong, something like that. Um, that's what justice is about, these necessary rules that, if they do get violated, authorize a kind of punishment. And we could actually, I think, I think it'd be helpful, I, I'm, I don't think I'm putting words in Mill's mouth that he wouldn't be happy about, but we might clarify this a little bit. By, by punishment, we mean justifies some interventionary force that maybe otherwise wouldn't be justified. So we don't have to think about punishment just in terms of, like, fining someone or a spanking or prison or something like that, right? Punishment could also include, uh, actually to use the child metaphor here, um, I, when I was growing up, my brother and sister and I uh, were all very close in age and we fight like cats and dogs. And my parents uh, didn't adjudicate those um, fights by figuring, like being the judge of like, okay, you did that, you did that, here's your punishment, here's your punishment. Instead, they just forced us to kind of reconcile by talking to each other uh, personally, intimately, and having to listen to each other and kind of try to repair our relationship. But that was a kind of punishment. And in some ways, it was like more obnoxious than getting grounded or something um, or having our, our uh, allowance taken away. I'm, it might have been more preferable to do that because uh, it's awkward to kind of do that stuff emotionally. But ultimately, I'm really happy they did. I think it was pretty good parenting. But it was still a punishment in the sense of they intervened with force. They made us talk to each other. Now, it wasn't handing down uh, just bad stuff we didn't want to have happen to us, in that sense of punishment. But it was an intervention of force that was justified because some kind of rule was violated. Okay, So that would fit the bill for what 
Mill is describing as the, the pattern of moral reasoning that's in, that justice involves. Okay? And you can see how that definition, hopefully, is going to be kind of fundamentally at odds with the utilitarian approach, because utilitarians don't have fundamental rules uh, other than the principle of utility. There's, they don't have fundamental rules for behavior. It always depends on the circumstances. Okay. Um, so even though that's not my favorite definition for justice in the big picture conversation about it, it's still probably the best way to define justice as an opponent of utilitarianism. That gets to the core of it. And all the other details about different content to fill out as the rules is not really necessary uh, to be able to get this robust opponent for the utilitarian. Okay, so here's how Mill wants to deal with this. Um, Mill wants to say, <clears throat> let's track down the feelings. Let's just look at justice for its own sake. Like, into, forget about utilitarianism. Set that off to the side. You justice fans, people who think in terms of justice about morality and think that's a good idea, all right, let's make your case for it. What are the feelings backing that up? Let's try to track those down. Mill's got some speculations, and I and I do think these are kind of he's maybe on shaky footing here, um, but I'll, I'll give you what he says and kind of think about it for yourself. Maybe you could make a better argument on his behalf, too, using his same style of reasoning with sentimentalism. But here's what Mill says. Mill thinks, well, man... <clears throat> Our commitment to justice goes deep, so I better dig deep if I'm going to find sentiments that could give it that amount of weight. So he goes really looking into the level of instincts, and the instincts he comes up with are the impulse of self-defense, which is about as basic of an instinct as you get, and sympathy for others' suffering, this universal care for all mankind, that when others are suffering, we're moved by that. Now, he thinks both of these are really, really basic. They're both very intense. Okay, so there's an intensity involved with them. And that's the, the intensity is where Mill thinks we derive the idea of necessary rules. Um, so let, let's talk about them in, in detail here. So impulse of self-defense. You're coming at me with a knife to kill me. I'm like, Wah! I just, I respond immediately, automatically, and with force that drops everything else. Like, maybe I'm like eating a cookie over here, and then you come at me with the knife. I'm not like, cookie, knife, cookie, knife, okay, I'm going to defend myself. It's more like, as soon as I see you coming at me with the knife, and that impulse of self-defense is triggered, um, the cookie's gone. Like, if I can forget about the cookie, cookie's dropped on the floor, not thinking about that. I'm, this is all consumed, consuming my attention. It's all consuming uh, the this impulse to defend myself, so it's it's very strong and automatic, and it feels necessary. It's like I can't imagine being a person who's like a knife is coming at me. Oh, there's a knife in me. Hmm. Like like I'm just completely stoic about it. That's not conceivable. Mill thinks if I'm I count myself as a human person. Um, so, or and maybe we'd say, can I imagine it? Yeah theoretically or something but if I've got that impulse of self-defense at least when it comes to myself I can't imagine myself not feeling anything like it's just so automatic so powerful um, and so that's where I get it overrides everything else so that's where I get the idea maybe of a necessary rule a necessary rule is like a conceptual or rational version of this kind of emotional phenomenon uh, of this instinct. And the same is true with sympathy for the suffering of others. And uh, sometimes I've, I've heard students be like, ah, I'm not so sure that's quite as strong. And I'm like, let me make a case. And, and I've come up with this case. And I'm sorry if this is disturbing. Um, let's say I'm walking home and I'm checking my mail and I look over at my neighbor's yard and my neighbor's just kicking the shit out of a puppy. I'm going to have a reaction to that. I bet you would too. And it's not, I actually told this story once in class, and a, and a student just let out a yelp. As soon as I described it, they're just like, ah! <laughs> I was like, whoa! <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Just, she was so, just even imagining it triggered that, that instinct of sympathy for others suffering so strongly that she just let out an audible gasp, right? So uh, that, as soon as I witnessed that, I'm not going to be like, Hmm, I, I'm kind of, I'm not cool with that. 
or something. I mean, it's going to be a strong emotion. It's going to overpower everything. I'm not going to be thinking about the mail anymore. Drop the mail. Forget the mail. And I'm probably going to go over there and do something. Um, or be just maybe floored, right? Where it's so consuming of my attention that I don't even think about maybe a response or something like that. I mean, it's that powerful. So again, very, very much overrides other things. Automatic. Uh, if you feel it, it's hard for you to imagine someone being human and not feeling that way about the same circumstances. Um, if the puppy thing doesn't go for you, just imagine a child or some, you know, they're kicking, just kicking a child uh, over and over, brutally, without any remorse. I mean, seeing that suffering is, is hard. Uh, it's kind of why um, uh, animal rights videos, maybe you've seen some of these where they show you how animals are being treated in factory farms and stuff, and it's like, even if you're like opposed to vegetarianism, it's just hard to watch those videos because they work on you and your sentiments and your feelings in a very, very strong way. Um, maybe you're a person who is desensitized. I had a student one time who was like, nope, I've watched those. They don't affect me. And I'm like, damn. <laughs> I mean, like, what has happened to you? What movies have you been watching? Um, so that's how Mill Mill's going to talk about it. the the idea that we get of justice having necessary rules. He thinks, well, it would make sense if these were the sentiments that are backing it up and giving it its weight. They're fitting the bill for that because they're so strong and so automatic that they feel necessary, and so we get the idea of, of necessary rules. Okay, what about the other part? What about the part about punishment and uh, authorization for interventionary force? Mill speculates that, uh, again, these two instincts are the ones responsible, and they, uh, de the, you get the derivation of this idea of, of the justification for interventionary force from the content of those instincts. Both of them prompt you to use force, either in self-defense, even if you're just shielding yourself, much less attacking, um, but you're going to use force to interrupt something that's happening, or in the case of sympathy for the suffering of others, like in the dog case, I'm going to go over there and try to get between them, right? Separate them, stop the suffering. I'm prompted to do that, to, to inject with force. So that's where Mill thinks the idea of punishment comes from. So what Mill's sort of saying is that even if I'm like watching CNN and, and then like a trial or something, some court trial, um, and everything's calm, people are in suits, they're talking calmly, taking turns talking, everyone's sitting and watching silently, that if I have a feeling like justice is being served, this is right, this is what ought to be happening, something like that, that it really is deriving from these really basic parts of our psychology. Uh, it's not like when I'm watching a courtroom or something that it's like the person coming at me with a knife. But these ideas, these rational concepts are derivatives of that. And we find them compelling because they're connected with the, these deep parts of our psychology and our nature. Okay, so that's the argument. Uh, almost. There's one final step, and I bet you can guess where this is going. If the sentiments that are giving all the support to our commitment to justice are the impulse of self-defense and sympathy for others, if Mill's right about that, then he's got a pretty good argument for saying that our concern for justice is really rooted in utility. Because what are the objects of value when we're talking about the impulse of self-defense? Well, it's a concern about my utility, my own happiness. I don't want to be killed or maimed or injured. Um, I don't want that. And that's what I'm protecting when I use force in defense of myself. And the same thing, is, it's still utility that's on the radar when we're concerned about sympathy for the suffering of others. We're, we're thinking about their disutility, the pain they're experiencing, and wanting them to be happy. Um, Mill actually, so another thing about him being a hippie, he says at one point he's like, he's like, yeah, selfishness is out there, um, but you know what else is out there in human nature? Everyone, Mill believes, has this basic instinct of concern, regard for other people and what happens to them. He thinks people who are calloused or selfish or egocentric, or narcissistic, or something like this. There are people who uh, that instinct, that drive, has just been smothered, or twisted, or distorted, or something, but everyone's got it, basically. Um, we don't always follow it. We are definitely tempted away from it, or distracted. Uh, it gets covered up. 
it gets uh, yeah distraction is a major thing for Mill Mill's thought thinking on this um, but it's still there it's still there um, so uh, these two instincts are ultimately about utility and they're if they're the ones providing all the support for why we give authority to justice then again justice prioritized under utility it's still good justice is a huge deal for mill mill's got a lot of things to say about justice and and how important it is um, but it's really important it's in service of utility so think about it kind of like this just the same way that the laws the governmental laws of justice are subservient to whether or not they maximize happiness so like mill would say how should we make governmental decisions well, it's based on whether having that law improves the lives of people or not. How does it affect people and their well-being, their happiness, their way of life? Um, the same thing is true of rules of justice. Just like legal rules, rules of justice are only appropriate if they're actually serving people. Maybe you've heard this little phrase, um, uh, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is... Uh, like Sunday, it's a holy day in Judaism, where you honor God, you don't do work, and this sort of thing. Um, this is a, a sentiment, this little phrase is worried about when we fetishize moral rules instead of thinking about why we came up with the rule in the first place. And Mill's thinking the ultimate measuring stick for all of our other rules and measuring sticks should be utility. So how do we know when we've gotten off the rails? It's when the rules of justice that we hold to ourselves and to each other are no longer doing anything that improves people's lives. And if they're hurting people's lives, then they're not just. So it, justice is always evaluated in terms of utility when Mill's talking about it. And this was his argument for why that's the right way to think about it. So um, I hope that makes sense. Uh, that's how far I wanted to get here tonight. That, that's all I, we're going to cover about Mill in terms of stuff I was going to present. Um, if there are parts of the theory that still don't make a lot of sense, or especially, you know, for me, I really care that you have an idea of why Mill thinks this is right, how he's trying to justify it. This idea of using feelings and emotions as a source of moral authority is very, very interesting and going to be in competition with other moral perspectives we're going to take a look at. Certainly the idea of everything coming down to well-being and what happens to people in a way that builds a lot of subjectivity into it, which means that uh, you know we can acknowledge a diverse set of ways in which people can be happy and make room for that. Um, that's a pretty big part of utilitarianism that has legacy into moral reasoning today. Um, there's, there's a lot about this theory that's going to be very relevant for what we're going to do going forward, so I want to make sure things are going well. My plan is to get started on Mill, or um, get started on Kant right away on uh, next Tuesday. So, um, so yeah, that's that's what I'd like to do. So, if you do have questions about Mill, send them my way. If anyone in the chat has some questions, put them in right now if you want to talk about them. Um, otherwise, I, I might, if I get some stuff from from students, I'll I'll weave that into the beginning of my lecture on Tuesday. Um, but yeah. I want to keep keep us moving along. How are we doing, chat? Video is at like two hours seven minutes, so I'm thinking it's a good session for tonight. But if you do have some questions, this is the best time. I remembered. I didn't need a reminder. Special code. We need a code. Um, well, I got some mail here. Uh, man, I got the most boring codes ever, but I'll, I'll try to come up with some good ones. Um, how about, sorry, I don't have anything better. Um, stamps. Stamps is the code word. Oh, Borg. Borg would be great. Let's do Borg. Yeah, Star Trek reference. Um, if anyone writes stamps in the quiz, I'll give you credit. But if you write Borg, extra credit. No, I'm joking. I'll give you the same credit. But let's do Borg. Borg is a code word. Or stamps. One or the other. 
uh, not bored, uh, but B O R G. Uh, again, maybe if you're a Star Trek fan, put Borg in, and then I'll know you're a Star Trek fan. If you're not, stamps is fine as a code word, and then I'll, then I'll know that you need to watch Star Trek. Well, I'm not uh, seeing any questions. Yeah, that's right. Uh, oh, journal entry about a page long. So uh, I talked about this a little bit um, in the last video and in an announcement. Um, the I think the best way for us to proceed, kind of changing the parameters just ever so slightly, because uh, people format it different ways, stuff like that. The requirement is minimum 500 words. So for the journal entry, let's do this weekend, 500 words. If you want to make it bigger, go for it. 500 words for philosophy just poof, disappears. Um, it's hard to get to a lot of depth in terms of argumentation, back and forth debate in 500. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do that as minimum. You can get something done in 500. Um, you're wondering about write anything? Um, so not, uh, I mean, it's very open. The, the only parameters I'm really saying are one, uh, try to have focus, so don't write about everything, um, but have it be something from the week. So that, that is something I want. Something from probably utilitarianism, since that's what we were doing this week. Uh, some part of it, some idea, theory, argument, something like that. Some dynamic to it. And, and don't try to do everything. Just focus, try to pick something that you are interested in or that you have some opinions about. Um, and focus in on that and dive into that with some depth. That's how the journals are going to serve you the best. Uh, both just intrinsically for helping you process the material, um, but getting practice at doing philosophy too in a way that's going to serve you for the final paper. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yes, good night. Thanks, everyone. I'm not seeing any other questions popping up. So I think we'll, we'll wrap up this video. See you on YouTube later on. Again, um, I've only talked with a few people in this class uh, outside of or at all, like their email or some stuff like that. But you're always free to contact me whenever you want. Um, I, I, the more kind of personal contact we can have, I think the better for this, for the experience of taking a class online. Um, I kind of think it's sad if we don't get to work cooperatively, and I'm just a kind of a talking head on YouTube. But so don't be shy about uh, reaching out um, if you want to talk anything over. Uh, if anything's not making sense, I want to help that. And but even if it's not, if you just want to kind of chew on some things or talk about anything, I'm I'm happy to do that. Okay. Good night, everyone.